thank you very much for the introduction. Can everybody hear me well? Great. Well, my name is Marco Cerezo, and I'm going to be talking to you about factorization and criticality in spin systems. These are some works that I've been doing in collaboration with my supervisors, Raúl Rossignoli and Norma Canosa at the Instituto de Física de La Plata in Buenos Aires, Argentina. This is basically an outline of what's going to be my PhD presentation, so you're kind of my guinea pig. So any comments afterwards are more than welcome. So what am I going to be talking to you about? Uh, first of all, I want to talk to you why I'm particularly interested in factorization and spin systems, as I mostly worked in the field of quantum information and quantum computation. Then I'm going to try to explain to you what this factorization thing is that, that I've been working on. And uh, it's, I'm going to spoil it a bit, but it's a general method from which you can get results. And I'm going to try to apply it to get some results in general XYZ couplings, in general spin systems with XYZ couplings, and in systems with XXX couplings. So then I'm going to be talking about this. You probably won't understand it now, but separable ground state engineering. We'll get there in a bit. And some conclusions. Well. What is quantum information and quantum computation? As Professor Schaudens already talked about this a little bit, I'll try to go a little bit faster. But it's basically the study of the information processing tasks that we can do with quantum systems. This was first uh, introduced, or sort of one of the first to think about this possibility was Richard Feynman. Because we were with one big problem. When you have a quantum system which you want to simulate, the amount of numbers, the amount of the matrix that you have to diagonalize grows exponentially with the size of the system. And this was a big problem. So it was a computationally very hard problem. And he said, well, the problem is that we're trying to simulate quantum systems using classical systems. Why not try to simulate quantum systems using quantum systems? It was later on discovered that not only you could, there is the possibility of the simulation of quantum systems, but you can also perform all other uh, sort of operation. For example, it was shown that there are some quantum algorithms which can, which can perform so, some operations faster than their classical counterpart. You have the Deutsch uh, search algorithm, which Professor Schouten has already talked about. You have, you have short factoris factorization algorithm, which is this thing you have here. Let me try and see if I can get this out. No idea. I think not. Which basically what you have is uh, you input some system, you initialize it, in a separable state, you perform some computations, you measure, and you have a result. This is the general idea of a quantum algorithm. And also, it has been proven that using quantum systems to process information, you can generate new ways of information transmission, such as the teleportation protocols, or new and, I don't want to say better, but different uh, cryptography schemes which you can perform. So basically, a few years ago, not so long, we used to talk about quantum information basically in two very different fields. Us in academics, just trying to see what we could do, performing some calculations, and in the realm of science fiction, where you had some science divulgator, some media which would get one paper and say, it's going to change the world, it's basically going to be the dawn of the quantum era. And also, I have to be honest, sometimes we also did it in order to get funding, but that's just between you and I. And uh, nowadays, it seems that those quantum computers that we used to dream about, they're starting to become real. They're starting to become a reality. You might have heard about D-Wave. D-Wave is not really, we don't, we're not sure if it's quantum or not. We don't know if it has coherence. It's a quantum annealer. It doesn't perform general computation. But still, there are s different groups working in quantum annealers. You have quantum computers, like the one Professor Schoutens was talking about, with five trapped ions, which you can manipulate, make them interact with, with each other. And you have all other sorts of quantum computers, which day by day, they're growing bigger and more powerful. You have Intel's quantum computer made of uh, uh, superconductive Josephson junctions, which nowadays has 49 qubits. You have Intel's quantum computer, which has 50 qubits. And there's just been a very recent announcement of Google promising a 79 qubit computer. So you see that it's a field that it's growing really, really fast. You also have quantum communications. Just last year, some uh, group of Chinese scientists, they launched to space a satellite which performs, uh, which generates entangled uh, photon pairs and is transmitted to Earth laboratories in order to get quantum communication. 
and this misused satellite called like that in honor of a Chinese philosopher and scientist who invented the pinhole camera has already been shown to be working and in it actually has been able to have the first uh, video call, like a Skype call, which has been quantum encrypted. So you see that it, it's a very interesting and fascinating field for me. And in this field, we all know that entanglement is a fundamental resource or one of the fundamental resources you can use to perform quantum information processing tasks. And uh, I've, when I first started studying, uh, I started studying entanglement in different many-body interacting systems. And it's, for you who don't know, entanglement is the some sort of quantum correlations that don't have a classical analog. And the problem of identifying and quantifying these correlations is a problem far from close. So it's still a very interesting and, uh, and motivating topic. So where do spin systems come in all of this? Well, spin systems, they don't, off they don't just offer a very attractive scenario to study quantum entanglement. But they can also be simulated, as you all probably know, with a wide range of physical systems. And for me, probably most importantly, is that they can be used as hardware to perform quantum information processing tasks. And that's exactly what I'm mostly interested in them. So I'm not going to be talking to you about uh, exactly solvable quantum systems where you can know everything, but about very special points. Because let's have some basic consideration of in general, non-solvable or solvable even uh, spin systems. Let's suppose you remove the magnetic field. You just have some interactions, quadratic interactions between the components of the spins. The ground state is usually going to be an entangled state. It's very rare to have something otherwise unless you have a fully magnetized uh, state. And usually the range of the pairwise entanglement, the entanglement between any two sp uh, spins, is has a range similar to that of the interaction. So if you have first neighbor interaction, usually the entanglement is going to be first neighbors. Second neighbor interaction, second neighbor entanglement, and so on and so on. Even in when you start to apply some uh, finite magnetic fields, the ground state will still be entangled. You will have to apply very strong magnetic fields to have a separable state, a non-entangled state. And this is actually what we do. Suppose you have a quantum system and you want to have a separable ground state. You may ask me, why would you want to have that? Well, as I told you, when you have a quantum process that you want to start, you have to initialize your system in a fully separable state. So the usual way to do so is by turning off the interactions, if you can. If you can fine tune them, you can just turn them off, or apply some very strong magnetic field. And that way, the spins will align with magnetic field. Now, a different question arises. Is it possible to have a separable ground state in the presence of interactions and finite magnetic fields? Surprisingly, at least for me, the answer is that it is possible. And it's those things called the factorizing fields. And there are very specific values of the magnetic field of that some very interesting things happen. For instance, you can have a ground state which is completely separable. It has no correlations. And when you step out of this state, which is a full product state, something even more interesting happened. The pairwise entanglement reaches full range. Every spin in the chain is entangled with every other spin in the chain. So you have this very interesting behavior. Also, they are interesting for me and for a lot of people because you can get analytical results at factorization points. And this is, in general, for non-solvable model, very important because if you can have a point or a line where you know some analytical results, you can do some perturbation theory and have some results nearby. You can test your simulation uh, programs to see if they are performing very well. So this is also very important. And it turns out that factorization points are usually, or lines are usually critical points or critical lines, as we'll see in a bit. So the thing that happens at the factorizing field actually is that the mean field solution becomes an exact solution of the system. And this is a highly non-trivial solution because usually mean field for us is like a first approximation. Like We don't expect this to happen. So this is a non-trivial solution for what's happening at the factorizing field. And for me, as, I've been, uh, as, um, as I'm trying to, to work on, these states can be used as initial states for quantum information processing tasks. So 
let's re re rewind a little bit and see where all of this factorization came from. There was a paper in 1981 uh, published by Kurman, Thomas, and Mueller. And in this very beautiful paper, they managed to prove that there was some factorization in antiferromagnetic chains with uh, first neighbor interactions. After that, there was a lot of work done with factorization, with some very beautiful papers being published. If you're interested, I can then give you all of the links. And even some of them done by, by the work group that uh, I started doing my PhD. And for me, reading the works that my group had done, something that struck me is that they usually were looking at factorization with transverse fields. You have some spin system with some interaction, and you just input a transverse field. And they saw if that had factorization. And I asked them, well, what about we try to generalize, find some general equations, not for transverse fields and for some type of coupling, but for the most general spin system that you can have with any field that you can think of. And that's what we first started doing. We took a NAND spin system with where the spins at each side, they can be different. This can be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, it doesn't matter. You can have any range of the interaction and you can have any magnetic field in any direction. And you try to ask yourself under which conditions will Hamiltonian such as this one have a separable state such as this one as an exact eigenstate. Now, Basically, what you are saying is that you have a state where it's a product state, and each one of the spins is rotated to a different direction. You can choose to rotate them all in the same direction and have a uniform separable state if you want. But we're trying to search for the most general equation. And it turns out that you have to satisfy two sets of the equations for this to be an exact eigenstates. The first, uh, they are independent of the fields, and they relate the alignment directions with the couplings of the system. This is an abbreviated form to write them. I don't want to give you all those big equations. So this is just basically, it's telling me, if you have this coupling, you solve this, and it's going to tell you what's the separable state that you can have in, this in your system. And you basically just get them canceling all the two spin side excitations when you ask for this to be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And the other set of equations are the field-dependent equations, which tell me what are the fields I have to input in the system in order to have factorization. And this set of equations is really interesting because they imply that the factorizing field, in general, has two contributions. And now I'm starting to think about this in a quantum information uh, set of mind, where I want to try to think of it as resources, as how much field do I have to input What's the least amount of complexity I have to apply to the system? And it turns out that in order to have this state as a, an eigenstate, you have to apply a field, which uh, this is going to tell you how strong it has to be, but it has to be perpendicular to the alignment direction. And if you apply th those perpendicular fields, your state is going to be an exact eigenstate. Then that could be an excited eigenstate. It can be the case that it's not a ground state. But then you have the possibility, since the spin is already aligned in a fixed direction, to apply a field parallel to the spin. And this, of course, will only shift the energy. It's not going to make it not become an exact eigenstate. So you can just start to think about shifting the energy of these ground states by applying parallel fields to the local alignment directions and bringing them towards the ground state of the state. And not making them the ground state, but making them a well-separated state. You can have it as far away as you want from the rest of the spectrum. So what, what, is this, is what is this good for? Why do I want to talk to you guys about this? Well, if you have a spin system, factorization and the equations that I just presented to you, they can be a very useful tool because you can use them, as I told you, to detect quantum entanglement phase transitions and critical points. You can determine order phases, for instance. You can obtain analytical results at some points and some curves. And as we will see, you can discover non-trivial behavior that uh, arises when you're studying this sort of, uh, of systems. And for me, they're also interesting because we can now start thinking of how to prepare separable states that can be useful. So the way this goes is you have a Hamiltonian, the one you're studying, and uh, you start to apply the factorization equations to see if those are compatible, you can have a separable state. Then you see what are the fields you have to apply 
you have the separable state as an exact eigenstate or even the ground state of the system. So this is like the general recipe. And it's the one I'm going to apply first in the x, y, z case, and then in the x, x, z case to see what can we, what can we discover when studying factorization. So first, I'm going to consider spin arrays with an isotropic x, y, z couplings in general fields. This is basically the problem that Kurman studied when he first started studying factorization. I'm going to review some very well-known re uh, results in ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic systems, which were studied by my work group and other groups that had been working on factorization. And I'm going to see if that by using these explicit equations, we can get any new results. So first, let's think about the antiferromagnetic anti spin chain, the one that Kurman studied. You have a XYZ chain with first neighbor couplings, and you can see that this state will possess an L-type separable ground state. I mean, they're going to be alternating in states. If your fields point to the surface of an ellipsoid, so basically, if you put any field pointing towards your fields pointing towards any point of this ellipsoid, this is going to be the ground state of the system, not even an excited state. And it had been shown that if you look closely at this, uh, this state, it breaks translation, translational invariance. So it must be a rise at a ground state level crossing, and it must always be twofold degenerate. And this is going to be important in a while. Uh, then, for, for magnetic spin systems, uh, it was usually found that those systems can possess a separable uniform state, now where all of the states are pointing in the same direction, if the states are pointing in a direction which is related to the couplings of the system, and if you apply this field, so you have a transverse field, this is what my work group mostly work on, at some point when the field equals this value given by the uh, couplings and the anisot anisotropy, you're going to have factorization. And this state is a ground state in ferromagnetic type systems. If you try to look at an L-type uh, separable state for, for magnetic systems, you're going to see it's an excited state, so it's not very interesting. And also, this state breaks parity symmetry. This doesn't have a, a well-defined parity. So it's also twofold degenerate. So in the two very well-known and very well-studied cases, you had factorization at some point or at some surface in field space, and they were both degenerate. So now let's try and revisit those problems. We already have our, our spin system, and we're going to propose that we want a uniform state. And you can prove that this is going to be an exact eigenstate if the spins, they're parallel to a principal plane. That means if phi, the rotation angle, the, I, I don't remember if it's the azimuthal angle. I'm really not sure, though. It's e either equal to zero or pi over two, or if theta, it's equal to, to pi over two. And when this happens, you have a, a solution, for instance, in the exit plane, when we recover the exact same equation as before, logically. And you have, now instead of finding just one specific value of the field, we find what has to be the lowest magnitude field that I have to apply. And it also belongs to the exit principal plane. So this isn't exactly what they had found, because this is the lowest field that I have to apply. This is not transverse. So when you apply this field, the state is an exact eigenstate. But as I told you, you can start to apply parallel fields. And at some point, you're going to have a parallel field of such strength that this is going to be the transverse field. And this is what they had found. But what becomes interesting is that if I still apply fields parallel to the spin the alignment direction, I can make this a non-degenerate ground state. And not only in ferromagnetic systems, but also in anti-ferromagnetic systems. And this was not known before. So now, instead of, of having a factorization point, I'm going to have factorization lines. And this can be done with a uniform field of the, f of a uniform field of the system. I don't have to fine-tune all of the interactions and all of the local fields. If we seek for NELP-type solutions, like the one that Kurman had found, now I'm studying general XYZ systems, I can find the exact same equation for the ellipsoid. And I can show that, as before, this is going to be the ground state in antiferromagnetic chains, but once again, the excited states in ferromagnetic chains. So in ferromagnetic systems, we have showed that we can have only the uniform ground state. But an for antiferromagnetic systems, we have null state and also the uniform state. And this was not well known. And we can start to build in the field space this sort of factorization uh, uh, 
diagrams. For instance, in for magnetic systems, when we say that the spin is going to be pointing at that this direction theta, we first apply a perpendicular field here. Dashed line means the state is an excited state. We start to apply parallel fields until eventually we bring it to the transverse field where it's twofold degenerate. We have theta and minus theta, and this is what they were seeing. And if we start to apply parallel fields, we're going to have a non-degenerate well separated from the rest of the spectrum uh, separable state. And of course, this is the projection of the Kurman's ellipsoid, an ellipse on the field. It's an excited state. And this is the diagram that it's becoming interesting because this was not well known, that I can also have this uniform ground state in antiferromagnetic system. And this is something that you wouldn't expect because you have an interacti interacting antiferromagnetic system and you have a uniform separable state as its ground state. This was very interesting for me. We can start to see uh, the entanglement, for instance, uh, since this is spin one and a half systems, uh, for instance, 12 pins, we can start to see that at factorization point, this becomes exactly separable. There is no concurrence, which is a measure of con concurrence, which is a measure of entanglement. And in the vicinity of entanglement, all of the spins are entangled with all of the other spins. You have a divergence of the range of the interactions. And in antiferromagnetic systems, you have, uh, I'm just so you to understand, moving on a field in this direction and this direction. So when I start making this field bigger, I'm going to cross first uh, the null ellipsoid, and then I'm going to reach the separable line. When I cross the the separability ellipse, I can see that there's a state cross. I can calculate the pairwise uh, right and left side uh, concurrences. I, they match with what I know from the Kurman side. And I can also have the separable state. I can also look at the magnetization. What happens with the uniform state? Since it's all of the spins are pointing towards a direction, this is going to be a fully aligned state. So the total magnetization of the system has to be one at this point. So you can measure the magnetization of the system, and you can see if you're detecting this factorization, because it's really easy to do so by watching at magnetization. And by watching at the gap, you can see that for with the first and second excited state, when you cross factorization, you can start to make it as separated as with the rest of the spectrum as you want. Now, that was the x, y, z case. Let's consider what happens when, you, when we take the x, x, z case. Sorry. So in this case, we're going to study general spin arrays with XXZ couplings, and we're going to input only non-uniform transverse fields. And you're going to tell me, well, you will try to get out of transverse fields, and now you're back to transverse fields. Why is that? Well, because if we input only transverse fields, we can still preserve that these states have a very well-defined magnetization. We're not going to break the, the fact that the Hamiltonian commutes with the total magnetization operator. So once again, we have what we're I'm going to write explicitly here for you to see what are these equations. And the field-independent equations, which, tel which tell me what's the state that we're going to get, are this, where we have you have to solve these equations for every interacting pair. And they're telling me the spins, uh, they're going to be rotated with an angle theta. You can find that the first set of equations, there were two, tell me that phi equals 0. And the second one relates the alignment direction with the couplings which with, with which they're coupled. And uh, when we see the what are the factorizing fields I have to apply, I can see that they are this. And first, and it, this can be very interesting, is that they do not depend of on the alignment direction of the, of the spins. So this is going to be imp very interesting later. And uh, since we have two solutions here for two separable states when two of the spins are coupled, I'm going to have, of course, two signs in the, in the factorizing fields. And they fulfill something that we call the zero-sum condition, which is also going to be important in a while. So just having those two equations, we can start to look at some properties of the system. For instance, when we calculate what's the energy of that separable state, it turns out that it con coincides with the energy of the maximally aligned state. It's a very simple energy, which it has. And uh, we can see that if the JC uh, coupling is bigger than zero, it means that's a ferromagnetic coupling because I had a minus sign on my Hamiltonian. This is going to be the ground state of the system. So once again, we're starting to see that factorization is in the ground state. This state, this separable state, of course, it's a separable state. It has no defined magnetization. 
it's breaking the symmetry of the system. And in fact, it has components from all other magnetizations which the system can possess. So it's going to have to arise at an exceptionally degenerate point where the ground state, where the ground state will have to be 2s plus 1 fold degenerate. Now, of course, we can have this ground state and we want to recover the magnetization component, for instance, because you want to try and move a little bit away from factorization and try to see what happens there at a given magnetization. We can do so by simply projecting onto the magnetization we want, where this is the projector operator onto total magnetization. And of course, all of these states uh, projected onto proper magnetization, they're going to be entangled unless we're the maximum magnetization, because there you have all of the spin aligned. And it can also be proved that in the vicinity of factorization, once again, entanglement reaches full range. So this is a property which we later proved that is general for all factorization cases. So let's start to play a little bit with this, because uh, I try to, when I have those equations, to think of them as some sort of a game. So that's what I say, how playing with Legos all of this time finally paid off. So you have those two equations. Let's first start at the ones that are coupling the spins. Suppose you have a spin chain, first neighbors. It can, let's not even consider boundary conditions. Let's just look at three interacting spins. These equations have to be solved for every two spins. So we take the first two spins. This, tell me, this tells me, you can take one of the spins, let's say the one theta i, I can plot this, and this is how they are related, I can say, well, theta i, I want it to be equal to this angle. I can go up, and this is going to be the first solution, minus sign, and this is going to be the second solution, plus sign. So I can start to say, well, I'm going to call my seed angle bar theta zero. It's not the same theta. This is more like a curly one. And then at each step, I can consider if I want to go with the minus sign, in which case I'm going to the theta minus one, or I can go with the plus sign. And the thing is that these signs are going to be re relevant because when I start to look at what are the factorizing fields I have to apply in the system, they will depend on the sign I took here. So for instance, if I took theta zero as my seed angle, then I choose the minus sign, I, I have to apply those two angles. <laughs> Let's go to the other one. Let's suppose that now to the right, I want to take the plus sign. This is going to be the field configuration. And of course, these are local fields. I want to apply a field on the spin. I have to add them up. And for instance, if I took those two angles, these are the fields that I have to apply to the system. And you can now start to see that when you're playing with this, different state configurations, different separable state configurations, are leading to different field configurations I have to apply to the system. So this phenomena in factorization they're going to depend what's the system, what's the state you have, depending on what are the fields you input to the system. So we can start playing with them, and we can see that in an open chain, if you are alternating, going back and forth, theta 0, theta 1, you're going to have some sort of a alternating field configuration that you have to apply. We can start to see that we can go theta 0, 1, 2, then go back, and you have this configuration where there are some, f uh, some of the spins which I don't have to apply any fields there for this to be a separable eigenstate. Of course, the state configuration is different. I can have with two zeros in the middle, and I can have the extreme case, where I, can, where I only have to apply two opposite fields, because remember that I have to fulfill the zero-sum condition at the borders, and I will still get this phenomena. So let's consider first this one. The most, uh, I, I think that, field configuration, which we can relate because it's a staggered field configuration. You don't have to config consider all of these strange fields. <laughs> if I apply these systems, the, uh, some alternating fields to the system, when they reach the factorization value, I know that this is going to be a separable state. And this can allow me to recover some solutions for the state because I can say, well, I know how the spins are related. I can, for instance, try and calculate the reduced density matrix. I can just project in any given magnetization and say, I have all of this information available to me. And I can see that I will only have three different uh, reduced states in this case. When I'm trying to reduce, uh, where I'm considering uh, sites at uh, odd and even, site number, odd, odd, and even, even. And when I first started doing this ca calculation, just uh, 
projecting onto a good magnetization, then tracing out the rest of the system, it seemed I was like, this, of course, will be a big expression. It's going to be a really hard because I had summations, I had the product, I, had com I have uh, binomials. It was really, really ugly. I took it to Mathematica, wrote it all, I hit enter, and magically, you have this closed formula where somehow, perhaps someone can explain it, I get the Jacobi polynomials. So now you have a very beautiful result where you can get the reduced state for a given magnetization for every two spins, and you can know it exactly. And it's this very beautiful formula. So what happens when we see magnetization and entanglement? As I told you, this separability state will have to be a very degenerate state. And at the degeneration point, I have to have components of all magnetizations. So when you see this, you can see that there's critic two very important points. This one right here, that's what where the factorization happens. When the fields alternating H1 and H2 at its side, they meet the factorization condition, the value that they have to have, I have this state, which is where factorization is happening. So you're starting to see that by looking at factorization, we find this critical point, which we couldn't find anywhere in the bibliography in the XXZ case that someone had studied. I only found this paper by al Karat where they studied only this line. And they saw the transition between a fully aligned state to an M equals zero state. But they barely missed it. So we're starting to see how factorization points are going to be critical points in the multidimensional field space. We can also see that in this case, in the vicinity of factorization, I can select any ground state with any given magnetization. I can just move the fields a little bit. And this is where the reduced uh, matrices that I found, reduced density matrix, are useful because I can now know results around here. And I can also see how now if I want, also in this state, this is becoming very general, by applying non-transverse field, I can break the symmetry and I can have any state with any given magnetization that I want as a separable non-magnetization with any given field uh, state angles configuration as a ground state. So by looking at uh, the entanglement, this is a spin one, eight spin chains. It reaches magnetization eight or minus eight. Uh, I have to study negativity. I cannot study concurrence anymore. And I starting to see how in the vicinity of factorization, first neighbor negativity, second neighbor, third neighbor, I still have this phenomenon of it being completely entangled. And these results are also very general. They are not valid just for spin one half and one. I can start to calculate uh, for a given magnetization at factorization point what the concurrence, what the negativity is going to be for spins, I don't know, one and a half to four. Because the, general, the formula I found for the reduced density state is very general. What happens when I start to see other of the field configurations that I, that I encounter? I see that I always get the same phenomena. In one dimensional, two dimensional, and even in the case where you have to apply only two fields on the border of the system. And if you see this, you're going to see that there's different behavior. If I go back just for a while, here you had this magnetic behavior, here I have this magnetic behavior. So we're starting to see that something different is happening in this case. And it turns out that when I apply fields in such a configuration, magnetization becomes different because this is a whole different phenomenon that I don't think anyone had ever found is happening. And what happens is that the field, the spins at the zero field, they are frustrated. So you have some sort of field industrial frustration in a ferromagnetic system, which is leading us to non-critical, uh, non-trivial critical behavior just by looking at new configurations which arose by looking at factorization. Now, how much time do I have? Oh, okay, great. And then I have time for this small bonus I prepared. 16, right? Not 6. Okay, perfect. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to consider because I like playing all of these little games is I can buy, build all of these different configurations, but how many do I have? I wanted to play a counting game. So when I have a spin chain at one of the sides, I can always pick a uh, two configurations for the next one, then two, then two, then two. And it's really s interesting to see that for a spin chain, there are two to the n minus one configurations. This is very trivial. 
when I start to look at bidimensional configurations, it wasn't so easy to do so. It, I realized that it became a problem. I became kind of obsessed with solving this. You can see in my place, I had papers with just numbers reading on them, counting them, like counting them one by one. I was becoming crazy. And I realized that counting state configurations or their corresponding factorizing field configuration wasn't really helping me. So I found this sort of uh, transformation which maps the field or the, f or the state configuration to a non-decreasing terraform. So this is easier because now I just have to count this uh, pile in blocks where the only rule is that when you move from the first place, you can either stay constant or go up by one. So now I start counting this. And I solve the two times n case where this is the number of configuration. The three times n case becomes a little bit more intricate. You have this sort of recursion formula where you have this uh, is the number of configurations which you get uh, like some sort of Fibonacci recursion. And this appears to be a, an integer when you put n integer. It was surprising for me. I've never worked with this sort of stuff. The four times n and the five times n case was still very difficult. And I don't want to count them all. So what I had was I had solved these three cases. I start putting n equals one, two, three, four, five. And I have these numbers. And I did what I think what any sane person would do. I took them, I copied them on Google, and I found this magnificent website. I've never heard of it. It's the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, where you just take a series of numbers, you copy them, and you're going to get, if they appear somewhere else, if you have a generating function. And I did exactly that. And it turns out that those numbers that I was trying to find they were already found by someone who was studying origami foldings, these Miyoura ori foldings. He was counting how many ways do you have to fold paper with some given set of rules. And he found this uh, transfer matrix where you can get the total number of configurations. So this was a really interesting exercise for me, and uh, I recommend that go play with the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. It's, it's really fun to do so if you haven't. Well, now I just want to leave you with a final thought. This separable ground state engineering, what is it? What am I doing here? So we saw those, equation, those equations, and usually we were thinking, what separable eigenstate can the system possess? You give me some couplings, I see what's the state I can have. This that I showed you. But you can also think about it the other way around. I can say, what's the state I want to have in a given system so which are the couplings that I have to have on the system? Can I now fine tune engineer the separable ground state I want? And it turns out that if you have some control over the couplings and the fields, it is feasible. And we started to work with some more mathematical properties of these equations. What can we show? Uh, under which conditions can you get uh, the state you want and whatnot? And I'm not going to get into the details because it's a little bit more intricate. But we were able to found some results, for instance. For every two spin directions you want the spins to have, there is always a non-zero XYZ coupling which will satisfy the field-independent equation. So this is great, because I can now start to build any state that I want. And I can also show that if I don't want to fine-tune the couplings, or if I can't, then given any alignment direction, there is always two other alignment directions which give rise, uh, which satisfy the equation I showed you before. So now what we were seeing before is just this lemma applied when we were those two signs we, ha we, we had before. Fixed coupling, I give one alignment directions, I have two for the other one. I can also show that this can be a non-degenerate ground state uh, with a controllable gap. I already showed you how this was done. And I can think what happens if I don't want to fine tune the couplings if I can only apply a uniform field. You can also show that for any XYZ type coupling, given two of the spins alignment directions which you can choose, there is always a uniform factorizing field which you have to apply to the system. Which This is also very good because now we can start to think about bulk separable ground state of engineering. If you don't want to fine tune all of the interactions, then don't. Just apply a uniform field to one part, you're going to have a state which you know a different state, a uh, uniform state in another part of the system, and now you have this bulk separable ground state engineering. And it can also be proven uh, analytically that in the vicinity of these points, there are always critical points. Pairwise interaction, 
pairwise entanglement always reaches full length. So uh, I, I'm someone who likes to cook, but I'm not very creative. Every time I cook, I have to have a recipe in front of me. So that's what I try to, to do here. What happens if you have tunable couplings or fixed couplings? For instance, I'm not going to go through all of the cases because it's pretty boring, but basically if you can tune the couplings, you can choose all of the alignment directions. You can work out what are the couplings that you have to apply between them. Then you work out, out the local fields, and then what are the fields that you have to apply at each of the sites. And you can even do so with a uniform field, as we have already proven. And also the same thing, you can have something with uh, local fields different or uniform fields, even if your couplings are fixed. And uh, this, I've been trying to tell that it can be useful to create separable initial states for, for instance, quantum annealing protocols, where instead of fine-tuning all of the interactions, uh, which you have to do, for instance, with a gate model quantum computation, here you have a s all separable state, which you can then make evolve with uh, for your quantum annealing. I'm right about to finish. So what was it that we have done, and what do I want you guys to take away from this lecture? I know it's not like the sort of things that you work or are used to, so I'm sorry about that. So we showed that there are some general conditions for the existence of factorization in separable of separable eigenstates in general spin arrays, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, any coupling you want. If you want to start studying a problem, which may or may not be solvable uh, completely analytically, and if you have the possibility to have fields, you can use those these tools to see if you can find some analytical results, perhaps in a point or in a line. And they're useful also, as we saw, to determine new critical behavior, which can arise when studying factorization. And when we're talking about uh, separable ground state engineering, engineering can be done, factorization can be done with very simple architectures, like the one I showed you, where you only have to apply two fields at the border of the system. Or you can have uh, some factorized states, which are very robust, robust against noise. Imagine that you cannot control exactly the interaction or the direction of the field, you still can get a separable state which you can use. So you can also, as I told you, en engineer separable ground states. And that's all, folks. Thank you very much for your attention.